Hi everyone, we've been reading about the Aztecs in Journeys, and today we're going to learn about another ancient civilization in the Americas. I'm going to read to you from Story of the World, and we're going to read about the Incas. When Spanish and Portuguese explorers landed in the New World, they found the Aztecs flourishing in Central America. They met Mayans living in small, scattered tribes throughout Central America. But when they traveled south, down into the continent of South America, they found yet another great civilization, the civilization of the Incas. The Incas lived in the mountains that run along the western coast of South America. Today, we call this area Peru. Like the Mayans, the Incas believed that their king was descended from the sun god. Here is the story they told about the beginnings of their civilization. Inti, the god of the sun, presided over the earth. Each day he rose and soared above it, looking down on it from the clouds. Each evening he sank down beneath it and swam through the waters that lie beneath the earth, back to the earth's far side so that he could rise and soar over it again. But when Inti looked down on the earth, he wasn't pleased with what he saw. The people who lived there were like beasts. They lived in the grass and ate what they could catch with their bare hands. Their hair grew in long tangled knots. They wore no clothes and when they met each other, they fought like wild animals. So Inti said to his great queen, Pachamama, who ruled the earth, look at these people, they live like animals in the dirt. We must teach them to build cities and roads, to wear clothes and to live together in peace. Pachamama agreed. So the ruler of the sun and the ruler of the earth summoned their son and daughter into presence. My children, the sun god Inti said, we are going to send you down to earth to teach the people who live there how to be civilized. Take with you this magical golden staff. When it leaps from your hand and sinks into the earth, there you will build a great city. The son and daughter agreed. Now the gods can enter the world of men, but they must do so through a door of still water. Inti's son and daughter found the door in Lake Titicaca. They passed through the door, rose from the lake, and began to walk through the world of men. Everywhere they found hunger, fear, and disease. Wherever they went, they taught men to speak, to build houses, to use herbs and spells to heal their disease, to grow food, to dress and cut their hair. Men began to stand up from the earth and to live as human beings. And Inti's son, Manco Capac, carried the magical golden staff with him everywhere they traveled. One day, as they walked through a fertile valley, the golden staff leaped from Manco Capac's hand and sank deep into the earth. Here is where we must build our city, Manco Capac said to his sister, so they began to build. Soon men came from all around to live in this city, built by the gods themselves. They named this city Cuzco, and the sons and grandsons and great-grandsons of Manco Capac, son of the god Inti, sat on the throne in Cuzco until this day. Cuzco was the capital city of the Incan Empire. This story claims to tell how Cuzco was built and why the king of the Incas had the right to rule there. Today, archaeologists can see from the ruins of Cuzco that it was a great city where thousands of Incas once lived. It had straight streets paved with cobblestones. The houses were made of stone, cut so carefully that the blocks fit firmly together without any mortar. They had very small doors and no windows because the mountain air was so cold. And the city itself is laid out in the shape of a puma, an animal sacred to the Incas. The Incan people never learned to write and they kept no histories. So we don't know very much about most of the Incan kings, but we do know that an Incan king named Huayna Capac became king of the Incas in 1493, the year after Columbus first landed in America. Huayna Capac ruled over an empire that stretched along the coast of South America for 2,500 miles, almost as long as the United States is wide. He built good wide roads all throughout his empire. Traders went back and forth on these roads, carrying their goods on llamas. These goods, beautiful cloth woven from the wool of llamas and sheep and dyed in bright colors, pottery jars, often made in the shape of animals or of men's heads, jewelry of gold and turquoise, traveled from one end of the empire to the other. The governors of the different cities all along the roads sent messages to each other as well, using a complicated code of knots tied into colored rope. Messengers ran along the roads, carrying these ropes from one city to the next. But when Huayna Capac died, he divided his empire between his two sons. One ruled the north, the other ruled the south. Soon, these two brothers began to fight with each other. Hundreds of Inca warriors died on both sides. The kingdoms of both brothers grew weaker and poorer. 
When more Spanish explorers arrived, anxious to settle down in the new continent they had discovered, the two war warring kings were too weak to resist. The Spanish marched over these broad, smooth Incan roads from one end of the empire to the other and destroyed it. So one thing that I noticed in there about the Incan Empire was that they did not have a written history, but they did have a way of communicating through the use of knots tied in colorful rope. That's called a quipu, and that's what we're gonna make today for our STEM project. All right, this video is to show you how to make an Incan quipu. A quipu is a system of records using knots tied into string. The Incans did not have a written um, system, so they would not have done this, but I made a little key so that you can tell what each of my strings stands for. So every time one of these events happens, I will come over to this string and I will tie a knot in the string, just like this. These are the materials that you need to find around your house in order to make a quipu. First, a piece of cardboard. This is just something that I cut off of a box that came in the mail. It's a piece of cardboard. This is about um, eight inches, about an eight inch square. Yours can be bigger or smaller. It doesn't matter. Scissors, some tape, and then any types of yarn or string that you have around the house. I have a lot of yarn from because I like to knit. You might have embroidery thread. That would work too. Shoelaces, old shoelaces would work. Um, anything that you have around the house. Step one, you're going to take uh, one color of yarn. I picked black for this. And you're going to cut a piece of yarn that's going to go, this is going to be the top of your quipu. So we're going to tie all the rest of the other pieces of yarn on this. So it needs to just be a little bit longer than your cardboard. We're gonna wrap it around and tape it in the back, just like that, after we put, actually we'll go ahead and tape one side of it. Don't tape both sides or it's gonna be really hard to tie the rest of your strings onto here. So just put one piece of tape on the back. And then you have a loose side and a secure side. Now we're going to cut the yarn that's going to hang down from our kipu, and you want these to be longer, okay? They're gonna have to be longer than this piece of cardboard so that you'll have room to tie your knots. And if you tie, if you make it too short and you need to tie a piece onto the end later on to keep counting, you can. So I'm just gonna tie, I'm gonna cut these. And these are about 13 or 14 inches long is about what I'm cutting here. So there's one, I'm picking all different colors. Some of my yarn, I noticed it's hard to tell that I've tied a knot. And so that's something that I'm gonna show you how to fix if that's happening with your yarn too. Let me show you how to tie these on. And if you want to do more colors than this or fewer colors than this, you can do that too. So to tie the string onto here, and you might need an adult to help you with this, you're just gonna, just like you're tying a knot, tying your shoes here. I'm just gonna kind of pick a spot on the end and tie the string in a double knot right there. And then just so I don't get confused, once it's tied really tight, I'm gonna trim this end off. seven strings on here. Now I'm going to wrap this around the back. Let's just slide over a little more. Luckily these will slide pretty easily. I'm going to wrap this around the back and pull it fairly tight. Don't want it to be too loose there at the top. And I'm just going to tape it. And now my kipu is, is ready for me to start recording all of my events. So you're gonna decide what each string is going to stand for. Like I said, um, I'm using mine as a way to sort of document time passing as we shelter in place here. Yours does not have to be that way, but I thought that would be a fun way to use this. On my original kipu, remember, I was tying knots in the string, so one knot for each time that event occurred, and that is perfectly fine. With some of my yarns, the knots are difficult to see. You can't tell really how many knots I have tied in this one. So I'm gonna show you an alternate way to use knots to keep track. So one thing you can do, this will help you um, be able to tie knots more easily. You can just cut off little pieces of string like this 
We're actually just going to tie these onto our main string here. Like I said, you could trim these, you could cut them a little bit shorter. Okay, so again, with this system, one knot would stand for one. Okay, now I'm gonna move over to this gold string over here, and I'm gonna show you a little more complex way that you can keep track of things. So those of you who are um, wanting to challenge yourselves with your math skills here, we're going to use a base 10 system here to keep track of events on this string. So let me cut off, we're gonna use this gold yarn. So I'm gonna cut off some pieces of gold yarn here to tie on. And for this system, you definitely wanna make sure that you're tying knots on like this and not just tying knots in the string the way I did on my first kipu because we're going to be able, we wanna be able to slide these up and down. So I'm just cutting several strings here that I can practice this with. Okay, now, Let's say this one, I'm gonna make this one stand for how many times I've cooked dinner, like how many meals I've made. So let me tie these strings on. Um, you know, I love to cook. So we're here at home and I've been trying new recipes and I wanna keep track of all of the recipes um, that I've tried here at home. So some new things, some old favorites that I, make, uh, that I make fairly often, we're making some of those. I love to try new foods, so we've been doing that for sure. Sometimes we do takeout from a local restaurant too. I could keep track of that, how many times we order takeout from a restaurant for sure. Um, and so if you're dealing with bigger numbers like this, like ordering takeout or how many pieces of pizza you've eaten, it also doesn't have to be food related. This could be how many times you saw a hummingbird outside on your hummingbird feeder. Um, it could be um, how many squirrels you've seen in your backyard. Somebody mentioned that um, they've had a lot more squirrels lately. So with a system like this, with knots like this, you can create a base 10 system by spacing out your knots. So in this case, let's say that I wanna say here that I have cooked 14 meals at home in my kitchen. So right here I have a um, ones place, a tens place, and my hundreds place is gonna be down here. Okay, so if, I, if I've cooked 14 meals, then I wanna have four in my ones place here. Okay, there's four. And then I've got one in my tens place. If it makes more sense to, for you to have the tens place on top, you can do that too. Just keep track of what system you're using because you're the one who's gonna be keeping count of things. For me, I did the ones on top, so I could have 10 right here, and then I could add a hundreds place down at the bottom if I wanted to. Again, if it works better for you to think about it as a hundreds at the top, you can do that. So this is uh, this stands for 14 meals that I've cooked at home, 10 in the, in the uh, so one in the tens place, and four in the ones place. So now, when I go, when I cook dinner tonight, I can tie another knot on. This is gonna make 15. I can tie one more knot on and slide it up to my ones. So now I've got 15 meals cooked at home. So you can use a base 10 system this way to keep track of your numbers. That's a little more challenging than just a counting by ones like this. And you can definitely do both on the same kipu. Um, that's why it helps to have a key like this for you so that you remember um, what exactly each color of string stands for. So I'm just gonna do this on the back of my kipu so that I don't have an extra piece of paper or cardboard to keep up with. So I'm just gonna turn this over and I'm stretching my, stretching my strings out so that I can tell uh, which colors I have here. Okay, so in my key, gold is going to represent how many meals that I've cooked. And I'm counting this one in base 10. So I'm just gonna make a note that it's base 10. Remember that means that I've got a hundreds place, a tens place, and a ones place. Okay, my light blue. I'm gonna use this one to count how many birds I see on my patio. Some other ideas that you could do, um, you could do how many times you have to take out the trash. We feel like we take out the trash a lot now that we're at home, we're generating more trash at home, so you could take out the trash. These are all extra ideas, and I wanna know what else you come up with. So after you make your kipu, 
send me a picture of it, post it on our Facebook page, or go to our Padlet and leave a comment telling what all you're keeping track of on your Inca Kipu. Have fun.